Welcome to Outer Space International Arts and Class Travel Podcast. Turning negatives into positives and fighting the far right today. An interview with Joe Solo. I'm Rob McDonald and I am your host for Outer Space International Arts and Class Struggle podcast. This podcast is part of a series of podcasts that we are doing um, related to the historical memory of the Spanish Civil War, particularly the Solidarity Park project. Um, so we're going to be talking to lots of artists involved in that project. What are their reasons to be involved? Um, what, how do they see the fight against fascism and the far right today? But also their general political outlook and touching on many of the questions that the podcast normally talks about. We're also going to make a bit of investigation into the role of women in the struggle for the historical memory today, the recuperation of the memory. We'd also like to thank the Diputacio de Barcelona and Amakel, the International Brigadistas Association in Catalonia, for their support in this project. Okay, let's go to the podcast. Well, welcome Joe Solo to the Outer Space podcast, supporting the Solidarity Park project. How are you doing, Joe, first of all? Hey, not bad. It's a bit cold in here tonight, but, you know, <laughs> fair enough. You're in your shed, are you? Your music shed. I am in the infamous shed built with solidarity to perform more solidarity. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I mean, you just, I mean, just for people who don't know you that well, you, you do uh, regular shows on Facebook and stuff and you do it from your shed, which I presume is at the back of your garden. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It, it's, it's proper base of operations. Even more so since, um, since lockdown came along because, uh, it's, it was my only venue for a good year or so. But, um, no, this is where everything gets done. Um, uh, live streams, rehearsing, recording. Yeah, this is this is it. But it's um, yeah, it's quite a place these days. Yeah, no, it looks it. I'd like. To, I mean, I'm a bit of a shed man. I'm a bit of a workshop space kind of guy, and so I, I look at it online. I think it looks really cool. You got your posters, you know, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, is that where is that where you write most of your music? Is that where you your creativity happens? No, I tend to write while I'm driving around at work. Really, I think the rhythm of the road really helps me. I tend to write words and melodies, and then bring them back and cook them up on the guitar. Um, I'm not one of those people who can sit down with a guitar and write a song, you know. Right, I, I, I have the song before I pick the guitar up, usually. Well, you're, you're a washing machine salesman, aren't you? Uh, salesman, sorry. No. M- m- repair man, yeah? Is yeah, yeah. I, I'm a repair man. So I, dri- I drive around all day, and sometimes up to a couple of hundred miles a day in my van, and, and then uh, maybe that again to do a gig on the night. So I, uh, the, the road and the movement and, and that just seems to seems to Isn't work how the blues start. were meant to be on the road kind of thing with the rhythm of the tracks that kind of thing so you got the rhythm of the engine have you or maybe the rhythm of the washing machine even i, I have no idea what the rhythm <laughs> is um but um it, it it's it's definitely conducive to writing particularly in the morning I, i'm quite interested in that because i know that the writers like Steinbeck and Hemingway and that they used to get up really early in the morning and then write and then Did stop they? and have breakfast and have and, and I think your brain works different in the morning. It's like it's wired differently before I guess it's before capitalism takes over and you have to do the <laughs> daily grind I'll stuff. I'll tell you know? what, Joe, I tell, I think you've got an interesting point there. People that know me very well is they know they, they get they get messages off me far too early in the morning because I wake up I, I've got uh, my life before as a young man's on a building site. So I, I, you know, I'm seven o'clock, six o'clock. I wake up at five most days, you know, and actually that's the clearest time I've, I think, you know, we're, we're recording this in the evening. People are listening. So I'm a bit more bumbling and I don't really know what I'm doing. But first thing in the morning, 
so yeah, that's yeah, when yeah. you write your songs. Okay, cool. Well, listen. Yeah, there's something in it. I think you wake up with. I, 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 I tend to wake up with a line in my head or something, and and sometimes some days it's rubbish, and some days you're just ripping on it for 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 a couple of hours before the day takes over. I, I think I probably wake up. I wake up an anarcho socialist, and then and then as, as the capitalism <laughs> creeps into the day, as the songs get washed out of you somehow. Well, no, I can see that. I mean, yeah, as it as it takes over, you start to lose your creativity, you start to lose your mind and your will to live. Sometimes, let's be honest. Yeah, some sometimes, but I mean, as so long as you still wake up, you, I think you're still fighting, aren't you? It's it's yeah. um, it's when you wake up a capitalist, then you've got to start worrying, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that's very true. You should always start. Oh, you should, should always start red in the morning. There should be a red star at night. You know, shepherds of light or something like that. Anyway, yeah, the reason red star in the morning, systems warning. That's oh, what it should here be. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Joe. Nice one. So, you got your interview today because we're doing a series of podcasts on the Solidarity Park project, on the historical memory of the Spanish Civil War. Um, you've played a good part in the Solidarity Park project so far. You were in the 2019 online uh, festival we did. You did a couple of songs following year um 2020 well actually no it's uh, this year 2021 i got that wrong um you did a whole set for us and you know i touched there a little bit on the shed and you're on the road and how you write one of the things i'm interested from you tonight is how do you start to create a, a song that you know talks about fighting against the far right fighting against fascism you know and often your songs uh talk about historical memories and stuff like that so i mean maybe run us through uh, some of the creative process that goes into that um well i i always think that i try to write with um one foot in the present and one foot in the past so when i sing a, a history song it's because I'm trying to say something about what's going on around me. And and I, and I think that it's twofold. One, if you can suggest it through history, then it shows you that these things keep coming back. They keep repeating themselves. Where if you're right in the moment now, there's no... There's no perspective on it. You, you know, it, it, it's like it's like pressing a panic button on something. Whereas if if you understand the history of, of fascism and you understand where it came from and how it developed, then uh, and understand that people defeated it before, then that that gives you more. I, I don't know. It's more inspiring because it, it shows you look. These these are dark times, but those were dark times too, and we beat them then and we'll beat them now. And I, you need that kind of thing going on, and. And, and the other thing I try and write is just working people um, in a situation like ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. I try and I try and write because I think that even if you don't um, know anything about the politics or understand the politics, even if you're not a lefty, if you can understand that a human being in a situation, it gives you a connection you wouldn't have if it was dry, tracked. You know, mm. so. That's how I try and write. I try and make, you know, emotional connections between human beings at the same time that I'm, I'm, I'm telling people this has happened before. We've done it before. We can do it again. So th that's that's my starting point. I kind of want to, yeah, I want to inspire. I don't just want it to be a, 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 a look at what happened to this poor man here. I, I want it to be a. I want the, his life and his death or her life and her death to mean some emotional and tangible and inspirational now so yeah can you, you uh, mention a couple of the songs that you've written in that sort of guys because i mean i'm interested in like okay so you learn about a history about somebody and you write about them is that like you go on the internet you find out or you read a book or what well, i mean give us an example of one of your songs right okay the, the the one that the one that everybody asks about the most is no pass around yes. um, and that, that was the one that kick-started that album um and I wanted to write an album about Spain, and I want, but I wanted to write about it through the international figures because the history of Spain is really, really complicated. And and so somebody from the outside sort of casting a, a, an opinion over it, I don't think works. I think that's that's that that's that, that seems to me a peculiarly um, Empire England thing to do. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? We. We, we have our judgments and we know better than somebody who actually lived through it and whose family was wrapped up in it. You know, we don't. And, 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 and so I didn't want to approach it from that subject, but from, from that angle. But the, the International Brigades 
is is a different thing altogether. Um, it and so it gave us uh, uh, this is the purity of the politics. These were the people who fought it. This is what they were fighting for, and this is where it went wrong and how it went wrong. is a, is is a, is an interesting way to write and an easier way to write, so that I'm not insulting generations of. Of, of, of people from Spain, you know, mm-hmm. whose, whose real lives and real relatives were wrapped up in this. Um, but that all started out, I wanted to write the record and it all started out from a friend of a friend, um, my friend Giles, his, um, his great uncle was Jack Atkinson who was killed right. at Harama. Okay, so you know, you know somebody from, because I know the yeah. song, Mo Pastor and, yeah. and I didn't know that you knew there was so, anything. Okay, so, excellent. So Giles, he, he, he got wind of it from my friend Andy that um, I was wanting to write this record. And he said, like, Andy's mentioned that you might be interested in my Uncle Jack. This is all I know about him. And he wrote me this letter and he included in the parcel um, a book by Tommy James. Um, it's called Lion of a Man. It's sit and pounded earth. It's Tommy James's sort of like quite short um, by, uh, autobiographical um, description of his life in Spain. And um, you see... Tommy James travelled on the train south with Jack Atkinson and another couple of people. One of them I know is Arnold Hall from Leeds, and I don't know the name of the other one. But um, Jack and Tommy obviously knew each other prior to the to Spain, and when Jack was shot, Tommy was the first person at his side. So imme- immediately you've got an emotional connection, you know? And so yeah, from that you, you go, right, this Jack Atkinson is a member of the Communist Party. He's 25 years old when he's killed. He's shot in the face by a fascist machine gun bullet. He's dead before he hits the ground. Tommy James finds him. What made him walk over those trenches into that hail of machine gun bullets? Because it wasn't a flag and it wasn't paid, like, as, as the poem goes. It was, it, it, it was conviction. You know? it, was, mm. it was a political certainty that that moment there, was exactly where he had to be and exactly the right thing to do. And he was willing to walk out there and die for, for politics, for, for what he believed in. And and perhaps not only did he die in Spain, but that did as well. That sense of certainty, because as you know through the history of Spain and what have you, the, the, the way that, that Stalinism operated, the way that the Workers' Revolution was, was, was crushed by... You, you know, the, the, the democratic government, the international brigade, right? you know, the, there's this triangle of people all fighting. It's very, very complicated, massively interesting. But that whole dream of of this being right and that being wrong seemed to die in Spain. Mm. And I wanted to capture the absolute moment of certainty when Jack Atkinson is walking into those bullets because what he believes in is worth dying for. Because that is the essence of what I, I think is important in our politics and important in um in, in in inspiring the next generation but I, i've said it through the mic loads of times but i don't think if jack atkinson had survived the war he would expect us our generation to die for the cause but i do think he would have expected us to live for it and mm. and that's kind of what i want to capture in those songs and i hope i did i think people get that i think that, so i think i captured that one pretty good yeah, no, I think, uh, well, I would definitely agree with you uh, on that. I mean, what do you, I mean, I'm interested in what you think the role of the artist is in this, because, uh, I mean, what do you think Jack Atkinson would think if he was here? Obviously, he had that, cert- that certain moment that you're talking about. I mean, he had probably quite a few certain moments to get that far, to be honest, hey, and to put yeah, himself absolutely. in that situation. And maybe he was shitting bricks just before he died. But the point, well, the point, the point being that he, he, he'd made that decision beforehand. So he made a political yes. decision. You know, and I sometimes wonder what these people, obviously you can't, obviously they're gone. Um, but what do you think he would think? Uh uh, on, a, on a purely personal level, he's a working class kid. He'd probably tell me to shut up and organise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a, a few, um, few artists have been told that in our time, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and rightly so in many ways, you know, because it, we, 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 um, the, the, there is that essence. I think we've spoken about this before, that the, the, the singer comes along, gets all the applause and then, and then leaves the people to, to actually do the, the ad graft afterwards. And so... Um, I, I've never wanted to be that way, so I hope that the, the, the other stuff I do in life actually proves that I act just a limelight stealer. But um, the, I think, yeah, I think he would tell me to shut up and organise. But I think he probably on the inside it would be 
quite quietly pleased that um, his life had meant something, you know, and mm. that that more people were gonna were gonna pick up that mantle and run with it. Because I think I think that's all any of us can hope for. It that we've we've earned the right for the next generation to climb on our shoulders, just as we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And I think quietly, if he knew that it inspired another generation to clamber on his shoulders and keep fighting, then it, it, it wouldn't have minded, you know. Yeah, I think that probably would be the case, wouldn't it? I mean, you mentioned that uh, the Spanish story is complicated. Um, yeah. and, and history, you know, history often is because it's often told by the victors to start with and those, you know, uh, have a, a different side to say. It takes time for that to feed through the generations and information and and all those kind of things. And one of, one of the things of the Solidarity Park project has been, yeah, we, we, we're we building a monument. Yeah, we're, we, we have artists involved and whatever. But it's about telling that story and not just from one side. Um, that's not to say we don't have sides and it doesn't say that there aren't big issues to discuss, but um, it's the idea of having a multiple amount of voices to build up a, a story that maybe is true. I mean, that's, that would be my thing about how Solidarity Park is. I mean, would you, would you think that's how you approach it in terms of being an artist and talking about something heavy and complicated, heavily difficult still today? This is not like, this isn't yesterday's story, Just. This is a story that the Madrid elections that happened, you know, a few months back, it was heavily laden with the Spanish Civil War propaganda, you know, between right and left and this sort of stuff. So I'm kind of interested, do you think as an artist, there's a, there's a special role that we can play in those complicated situations? Well, I think we have to, um, we have to humanise it, um, definitely, which is what I try and do in songs. Um, I, I would find it very difficult telling the other side, bearing in mind what it represents. Um, and, and I don't think that's my job. I think that's for a, a fascist songwriter to do that if they've got one. <laughs> um, but I, I think that you, you do need to tell that history and you do need to understand that history because you, you have to know where it comes from, you know? And because... Because strictly speaking, by by university definitions, Franco wasn't a fascist, was he? It was a it was a military dictator. Where he had fascist armies because they were backed by fascist states. But in in pure ideological sense, it was it was a military dictator with with fascistic forms of government rather than a fascist mm. leader, um, like like Mussolini or Hitler. Um, uh, and and a lot of the a lot of the fascist boxes went ticked. You know, he wasn't empire building. He wasn't invading other countries. That's not to say this man was nice. He wasn't. He was a <laughs> bastard. You know. But um, what what I'm getting at is um, you, uh, when when people throw the term fascist around, it's it's it, it loses some of its sense. And 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 uh, if you if you don't grasp the way that fascism happened in Italy and happened in Germany, um, then you, you don't understand how it can happen somewhere else. Mm. Um, and I mean, it crept in after the First World War in in in, um, in Italy when an election went the way of the liberal left and that government failed because the economic situation was that bad. And that shewed in this this new form of, of leadership and of and of and of, of, um, of exploiting the working class and I, I worry that we are on a, a rightward bent the continent over and that COVID and lockdown and the the the, the impact that that is having on on um, economies and on communities will present similar circumstances by the time it's played out to the catastrophe that economies faced at the end of the First World War. And I think that that, in combination with the rightward drift of societies, is precisely the place that Mussolini sprang from. And, and I think that if you don't see that, if you throw the word fascist around at anybody, 
then you're in danger of allowing history to repeat itself. So, yeah, we need to understand that side of the story and speak about that side of the story and things like this. But I don't think it's my place to sing about it because I think a song tends to glorify. Even if you're, even if you're underplaying something, it tends to glorify. And I, that, like I said, I think that's somebody else's job. If they want to glorify bastard we let them do it but i'm not doing it for them <laughs> i mean uh, there's some really interesting stuff in there and i'd like to unpick it a little bit because i mean you the overuse of the word fascism and i would agree with you you know that actually it is a scientific definition if you like you couldn't you can sort of play out what is the what is fascism what isn't military dictatorships the different uh, levels that you can do and that we we need to understand that so that we can actually tackle what we're facing and then and when yeah. i talk about stuff i talk about fascism and the far right you know and i often make that definition and uh we're fighting often the far right with fascist tendencies and this doesn't always have the same thing and 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 therefore we have to be quite uh, you know on the left we have to be quite we have to know what we're talking about if we're if we're yeah. gonna be, if we've got to build so i think that's i think that's very interesting what you say there and i would agree with you and i think that's hard in a song um to draw out those things so i appreciate what you said about making things human and the rest of it but those subtleties i mean i i know for myself uh, as a young guy trying to write political songs very hard to get subtlety you know uh, and if you're trying to explain a complicated story you're better off making a documentary uh, and being creative in that yeah. right than maybe a song but you hit something there which i think is probably going to be very important in the connection of artists the struggle and the historical memory being learned and you talked about covid because i think the last time we spoke um it was a couple of years ago actually wasn't it at least on the podcast pre-covid um if i remember rightly i mean uh, my memory's not too great in the evening as i remember it'd be better if we talked in the morning um <laughs> but this i mean the way that covid is uh, being utilized let's put it that way, by more authoritarian people. I mean, we're all very happy to have, I mean, I'm presuming you are happy to have a jab, happy to have my COVID passport, happy to do this, happy to do that. And then suddenly you go, hang on a minute. <laughs> they know everything I'm doing, everywhere I'm going, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of anger and distrust in society, you know, and it's based on the economy and stuff. So I was going to ask you a question about why you supported this sort of the, the historical stuff, but I'm interested now that you develop this point a little bit more about how you think things are going to play out and why we need to learn these messages um, of history. You know, um, do you think that we're going to enter, as you were indicating there, we're going to enter a much more right wing period where we, we have to, that's going to be one of our major fights? Do you see that as a, as a reality? I, I, th I think we're, we're already in it. I, I, I think that when. Um, when when Mussolini and when Hitler came to power, the, the the very first play of fascism is to attack the left, and it's to attack the left using, you, you know, uh, basically working class thuggery groups in those in those ages, wasn't it? You know, they they, they they all had the stormtroopers and they would shut down union meetings and attack communists and what have you. It it, it was it, it was to it was to destroy the left. It was to destroy organised resistance. And you see that playing out online and you see that playing out through the media uh, the, uh, in the UK, certainly. And um, you saw it with, with Jeremy Corbyn. You've seen it with um, Corbyn supporters. And you see those uh, attacks, um, they're, they're not necessarily physical anymore, but they are very much the same thing. They're, mm. they're, they're an attempt to silence and discredit voices on the left. So with, to me... We've already entered into the first stages of, of a potential thing, and if we, if you don't recognise that, you, you're gonna fall, you're gonna fall like an idiot for stage two and stage three. Um, uh, the COVID thing's interesting because, yeah, on one level, it's it is totalitarianism, and on another level, it it, it, it very definitely is saving lives. So, um, you've got that balance to strike, and and I think that um. I, th I think that that it's important. I, I think Chomsky does this best because he says he says you, that you have to question every bit of power in and of itself. And, and he gives the example of stopping a child running out into the road, and he says you've exerted power over another life 
but that power was for the good of that child, you know. So that on it, on its own it is is a is a, a proper use of power being exerted. Um, but you should always question every little bit of power, and and if you if you don't, then then you then you're in danger of allowing this to to cascade. Um, so you, you have to say to yourself when each thing comes along, be it lockdown, be it be it jabs, be it this, be it that, be it the other, be it masks. You've got to ask yourself: Is that proportionate, and is that is is that power worth yielding? And and at the moment, I, I think that is. Um, if it stuck around longer than it needed to do, then no, I'll fight it with every cell of my being because it would then be intrusive power for power's sake. But but right now, even as a uh, even as a, as a lefty uh, socialist with anarchist tendencies or whatever you want to do, whatever I woke up as this morning, <laughs> yes. um, I think I think um, uh, yeah, that I, I, I question those power plays on their own merit, and at the moment I don't find a reason to uh, fight them. Mm. I know plenty of people are doing, and I, I, but I, I think I think that's that's a worrying tendency too because. Um, how propaganda works is interesting because if you watch any news program in the UK, there'll be there'll be two stories that are apparently true because you can believe them with you. You, you, you could cross reference them and everything, and then another one that isn't. And the, the reason the lies get through is because they're surrounded by truth. Now, it, on one side, you've got people who believe everything they're told. That, and, and and that's that's dangerous because you've got you're not cross questioning authority. On the other side, this this new kind of people who don't believe anything they're told. They are the, the flip side of the other coin, but they're equally wrong. You know because propaganda's cleverer than that. It's not just telling you lies all day. It's mixing them in with truth. That's why it's so important. And that's why you've got to unpick it. You can't just deny everything in the same way that you can't accept everything. You've got to question each story on its own merits, pick it apart on its own merits. And that's how you get to what's a lie and what's the truth. It, it's massively important that people get that because those two things, accepting everything and denying everything, are part of the same problem just from the other side. Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, it's basically things are a living struggle. You know, there's no point, there's no point in getting out your dad's capital and going down the Saturday market with it because it's not going to impress in that way. Does On the same hand, we need to have read our stuff. We need to have understood the processes and how it works. I think, you know, I think I, I agree with you. You talked about, you talked about propaganda. You talked about COVID and you also mentioned in there Corbyn. And I think we saw what happened to him. You know, uh, and I think the last time we spoke, you just you just decided to leave <laughs> leave the Labour Party as you were in briefly, I believe. Uh, and uh, I think that was with, I think we talked about that a little bit at the time. Now that's a long story gone now, and now he's been he's been uh, he's still got the whip taken off him, hasn't he? And he's sitting there quietly in the corner, being a good boy uh, on one level, and then on the another level, he's doing his campaign. It's almost like. Uh, it's almost like he's gone back to where he was before he had the explosion of coming into the Labour leader. And that's nothing against him. I've got a lot of time for Corbyn. Um, but what happened to him was quite horrific in terms of the media and the propaganda. You know, and we a lot of alternative media turned out there is there is different things there's podcasts like this that don't get huge ratings but you know there's lots of places where we talk about stuff and i think that that's a necessity of the day eh? um and i'm kind of interested in in how you see the the let's say the battle of uh, battle of ideas and I, I think for artists we are in that battle of ideas and particularly people like yourself you know who talk about the historical memory talk about politics who got these things and myself you know, we are in that battle right now you've mentioned it we're in the maybe the first couple of stages of being in some serious danger that we need to get our shit together basically and put an alternative we need to pull our forces together as best we can and we still need to have those tough debates you know um i'm sort of wondering what's your sort of how, how have you viewed how the post corbyn era the attacks on him and if i can say it the attacks actually some of them have come at your door as well with the uh, hope not hate uh, business so i don't you, you have a perspective on all, all that at the moment um yeah i think that i think we spoke last time that that that, that um that the 
Gramsci best sums up Corbyn's situation. Um, Gramsci gave the analogy of the of the castle and the the ramparts and the moat and and, no, and yeah, the I forces, that, yeah, 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 the forces that, yeah. of the state are there to protect the castle and the castle is the establishment. And we're all on the outside. And Corbyn was stood on the top of the ramparts waving, saying, I'm about to lower the drawbridge, I'm about to lower the drawbridge. And and then, and then we were all going, oh, look, there's Jeremy Corbyn. Whoa, Jeremy Corbyn. He's about <laughs> to lower the Oh, is he? What, what should we do then? I don't know. Let's make a Corbyn T-shirt and a banner. And and uh, uh, we could have we could have stormed the castle, but somebody yeah. took him down and wound the drawbridge back up again because because we ain't got any ideology. We're, uh, we, we've, we've lost that. We've lost our class politics to me, and I think that's the massive danger. Um, we we are in an age where the left has lost its ideological centre, and it's a series of identity politics campaigns that don't that are all important. Don't get me wrong; they are all vitally important, but they need to match under the class banner rather than try and stack attack the establishment as separate entities because all that's going to do is get you a few crumbs off the table and, and then sit back down and then and then and then and well they got what we didn't get and so on so so on so and, and and it'll just instead of attacking that way we'll attack each other because so and so got more than so and without that class perspective we're in all kinds of danger I, I, actually going back to jack atkinson this is interesting because th this is this is this the highlights identity politics in in um Jack Atkinson, when he went over the top at Harano, was fighting Franco's fascists. Yes, he was, but they were Moroccans. Mm. So identity politics would have Jack Atkinson labelled as a racist because he was attacking somebody of colour. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's insane to think like that. You're not. You're not. You're. You're working class attacking fascist armies. Do you know once you start bringing in all the identities and things like that you're in all you're at sixes and sevens you no longer have that fight you no longer have that certainty that I spoke of before and 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 and, and it's it's a really really worrying thing that we, we we we've lost that that core and i don't know if it's if it's particular to the uk that we've lost our trade union movement and i know that that, that was a deliberate play by Reagan and Thatcher in the eighties to destroy organised trade unionism, to to take it down, so that that working class people weren't brought up on these sort of ideological principles. And um, I don't know if it's a result of that, if it's just the UK thing, if it goes right the way across Europe. But I do know that we have been severely weakened by our loss of that sense of ideological centre that we are now. The left is a series of campaigning groups trying to uh, trying to get concessions out of capitalism rather than trying to take it down. And do you think the class the question can be sort of explained in the historical memory of the Spanish Civil War? Do you think that's one of its potentials as a as a historical moment? Well, all those things are playing out, aren't they? Because at the same time that uh, uh, at the same time, give or take, uh, as as Franco's and um, 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 coup, cool. you've got um, a workers' revolution taking place, haven't you? You've got the, the CNT and the PUM organising workers and the, the peasants taking over the farmlands and and and, and, and the business. So you've got two revolutions happening at the same time, and in between them, what's essentially a, a bourgeois liberal state. I know we, we all rush to its side and, and fly its flag, but in essence, it's a bourgeois liberal state. Stalin comes in, doesn't want to upset the West, so it, 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 you know, he keeps the essence of that state in place and turns against the workers' revolution that he originally stood for. So it, it gets really complicated, but in there you see that that split between people. So again, you can you can hold up our current problems to Spain. You've got the people who ran to the workers' revolution. You've got the people who ran to the armed revolution, the, 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 the dictator, and you've got the people who sought the solace in a, in a bourgeois capitalist state. And there's, albeit a socialist one, don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not picking sides here. I'm just saying that you've got um, you've got the same kind of thing playing out now but the the more that you flock to a, a capitalist structure looking for socialist outcomes the more you're going to be disappointed and I, I, over here i always say that if, if you even with corbyn in charge he would never have got anything from parliament there was there was not enough socialist labor mps for him to make any dent whatsoever in in the outcomes of, of working class people beyond 
giving them something to cheer about. It just wouldn't have happened because the Palace of Westminster is an establishment state. It is not going to vote itself socialist. <laughs> not, not on any level is that going to vote itself socialist. So it, while I was disappointed to see the end of that because I thought it, it was good, it was getting people thinking about thinking about leftist politics and what could be achieved and how communities could be improved and how the world could be better, it wasn't going to be socialism. It was going to be... Uh, uh, a, 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 a more liberalised version of capitalism, a more a, 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 a liberalism with um, with some socialistic tendencies. Um, yeah, that, I like you know, no, what I mean? so, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I see, I see where you're going with that one. The, I mean, from Solidarity Park's point of view, which obviously I'm a, one of the uh, coordinators of. Um, you know, your work with us has been outstanding you're one of the easiest artists to work with because you say joe joe can you do it and you're there you know um and i know for for instance on the uh we had a real worry about uh, copywriting a couple of days before the live stuff we put out at last year's festival and you did a whole new set for us and I'm also, I get lost in the amount of projects that you're involved in. I watch your, I think I work hard, and I do. And I watch uh, I, how you work, and I think, bloody hell, he, he, I want some of the uh, tablets he's taking. Um, so, I mean, for me, I, I think your work rate, your your commitment to the cause are second to none. And and I just want to ask you, because I mentioned it in my, in my last question, I did want to sort of come to this uh, this this blip <laughs> in the situation that happened recently because you stood you you were in the hope not hate um i don't know uh person of the year or whatever it was i can't exactly remember somebody who struggled hard i saw that i voted for you i went straight to the thing did it and it you know it was obvious because of all the work you've done and i was thinking yeah give, give the give the guy an award you know uh, that kind of feeling it came for me and i think a lot of people did the same and then it all went a bit pear-shaped eh um, I don't know if you if you want to, if you can explain some of that to the listeners and give us a, give us a bit of an opinion. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. I can First of all, I, I, as I've said before, I don't, I don't want to attack hope not hate per se on this. I think they do some good work, particularly in communities, particularly the street teams. I think are brilliant. I think I think on this one they got it wrong, and I think they laid themselves wide open, and I think um, they bowed too quickly to pressure. Um, the Maybe allowed... explain a little bit what happened because not everybody will okay, know. I, I was nominated for um, I was nominated for a, 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 a hope award um, by a member of the public, and um, there were three hundred plus um, people nominated, and um, hope not hate themselves shortlisted six, and that was one of the six. So uh, that was when you started to see the posts on Facebook because we were asked to campaign, you know. And I, I've not actually wanted to go for this, but I spoke to the We Shall Overcome guys and, and they said, look, it's been a tough year to raise any money. There's £5,000 attached to that prize fund and you, 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 you really need to go for this because that's a lot of help we can get to be Black Christmas if you win it. So I said, you know, fair enough, I'll, I'll, I'll take one for the team. I, I don't like coverage. I, I don't think it works. I think if you ask... I, I, well, certainly the musicians I know, if you get some um, national radio play, if you sell one CD off the back of that, you're lucky. It, it, it doesn't have the impact that people think it has, yeah, but what yeah. it does do is expose you to negativity. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I think I, I'm probably, I think, more in line with anarcho-syndicalism in that I think small numbers of people can do more than large numbers of people, um, because large numbers of people tend to cede responsibility to the person stood next to them, and you also draw in people who are just going to diss everything and put it down and destroy it, whereas small numbers of really positive people can achieve great things, which is what We Shall Overcome is all about. Um, so I don't like national coverage. I've never been one who wanted to be a star. I've never been one who wanted a record deal and international tours and all that. Because I know I'm really effective if you put me in front of a small number of people and we have that to and fro in between us in a gig, you know. And so um, I'm quite happy to operate like that and I'm quite effective at working like that. And I bring people together who've never seen me play a show before because of how I can operate online. But what happened was that as soon as... I was put on that pedestal. 
and it, and I don't think this was me. I think the attack was at hope, not here, because I think everybody who was shortlisted will have gone through the same thing that the the the, the cancel culture trolls will have been on there, done the research about every last one of us, and the first the person that won the prize would be the one that got took down. Right? Mm -hmm. I think it was an attack on hope, not hate, an attack on the left. I don't think it was aimed specifically at me, so I don't take it personally. I think the way that Hope Not Hate reacted was personal to me, but I don't think the process itself was. And I think that um, it would have happened to whoever won that prize, and I think it was just a part of what we've spoken about before. Mm. This kind I, of think, I think that's interesting to connect the two, yeah? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a rolling... It's a rolling takedown of anybody on the left who sticks their head above the parapet with any kind of positive message that seems to be that seems to have some momentum. So they immediately trolled back through my posts, dug, dug up some stuff that was um, that I, I, I had two posts where I'd supported Chris Williamson over points of order in the Labour Party and and then extended that to me being anti-Semitic. Um, at this point, on both of those posts. Um, Chris was found not guilty of the charges. So how I can be supporting a not guilty man and found guilty, I, I don't know. And I, I described that as, um, as, as a process of, of, of retrospective guilt by association, which I think is as dangerous fascistic undertones in and of itself, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, for, for, for a day or two, I was, I was tearing my hair out thinking, have I done something? Have I, have, have, yeah. have I opened my door? Have, 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 have I made, I a, have I made a blunder on telly kind of thing? Have I said yeah, the yeah, wrong yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I read back through the post and I thought, no, I've, I've, both of these times I've supported him publicly, he was found not guilty and he was he, he was reinstated after one and, and when he wasn't reinstated after the other, the courts ruled in favour of him against the Labour Party. So I was right to support him in struggle yeah. In a, in a period where of turmoil, and I, on both occasions I was borne out by the process and the law, and and on both occasions I was even saying, look, we need to take seriously this problem of racism and anti-Semitism. It needs dealing with, but I don't believe this is it, you know. Mm. And so um, after a while, I thought, well, look, I'm not wrong here. I'm just they're, they're just literally deliberately misquoting me in order to in order to cause this fuss. At that point, I would have hoped. That 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 hope not hit would have would have would have sent would have the, the that packing, basic you know? thing that's going on in society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and instead they 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 facilitated it. They allowed and, that to happen. They allowed an awful lot of nasty stuff to appear on their threads and stay on their threads. And how how do you think? I mean, this, I mean, this, I want to diverge slightly because I you know I've had my rumbles <laughs> in time, and we have a great potential of attacking each other on the left and and you think it's a weakness of our ideology base this class question we talked about or do you think we got you know we've got a bit lost uh, the fact that um or how, how can it how, how can we be so weak if you know what i'm saying uh, um, well, because i, I think if anybody was yeah because if think, anybody looks at your record you know and looked at those posts they would say right bollocks move on exactly you know, and and every Every working class socialist that I know was either on my mobile phone supporting me, <laughs> right. was texting me, was sending me messages behind the scenes, was was attacking the trolls. I'm thinking every single one of them. The problem with the left is it's populated by fifth columnist centralist liberals, and it's them that do the attacking. The socialists were right on my shoulder right the way for a while. They said, "That's bollocks." Good Joe's point. a good guy. Look at all the things he does. That this is absolute nonsense. They were right with me right the way from the start, from day one. It's the fact that you've got them other voices in there that, that want to keep the left as as a as a buffer between the working class and change. And that's their job and they do it very well. And um, so I, when we say the left tears itself apart, it doesn't. The left is really strong. It's the centrists that tear the left apart. And that's another thing you need to recognise. So that we don't, oh, bloody lefties are always falling out with each other. No, lefties stand strong. Genuine lefties. I, I, I'm not going to name names because it's not fair, but some quite some quite famous people were at my shoulder right the way mm. from the start, and the real socialists always will be. 
it's the fact that uh, the, the left is populated by people who aren't socialist. If they say they are, they've not got ideology at the core. That they just they just believe that this could be fair and that could be fair. And, and if we tweak capitalism and make it a little bit nicer, then everything will be all right. But they're just liberals, you know. They're not. They're yeah, not socialists. No, I, I Real socialists are, are there. They're fighting for each other, you know. Yeah, we know when the when the shit gets tough, we put a few things aside and we fight. You know, yeah. I think, and I and I think maybe just to wrap up the story there for the people who are listening, go. What are they really talking about? What's going? What what happened in the end? What was the response? I mean, you didn't get your five grand because uh, you won basically. Yeah, you won I, I, the, got, I mean, you won the popular vote. Uh, I, I, won the, then, I won the vote. Um, I, I they withdrew the award within twenty four hours, thirty six hours. Um, I'd already committed to spending the money. Um, I, uh, you know, it was going out to to street teams, to to homeless support, to to community outreach, um, and they withdrew the money. Then there was such a, a backlash from the other side that they phoned me up and offered me the money, um, and I politely declined um, in words I probably can't use on a podcast. And because you can that, on that this would one be if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, no, we to me, taking it. that money. That was then. That was then tainted money. That was then the yeah. equivalent of me crossing a picket line, and I couldn't do it. You know, it, yeah. it, even though people were going to go without, there's a principle there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not taking money that's been withdrawn from me, and, and my name's been smeared, and you've allowed that to happen. I'm not taking that money. That's that's tainted money. You know, um, but a brilliant bloke called Tony Booth saw that, and he set up a GoFundMe, and gave people something to rally around rather than fighting trolls on threads which is a mm, which, which so, just yeah. makes you feel ill doesn't it because you yeah, get you so get I've nowhere. been there yeah it, it's yeah, yeah yeah you just just leave them to it block and delete just <laughs> no point no point um the um so he said this go for me and it, it gave people who who, who, who didn't want to roll up the sleeves and get the fists out something to rally around and fight so instead of the five grand we finished with ten grand so we doubled the prize money and that cleared on Monday actually I've just been giving it away I've been giving it away up and down the country to to, to um, working class anti-fascist causes so we can keep can keep the far right off our estates and stuff by um, getting them getting them food parcels out to people making sure they know that it's coming wrapped in unity and solidarity you know so in the end we've done good with that situation and, and, I, and I can't thank Tony or the people that rallied to me side enough nor can I thank the people who were sending me messages enough because it, it, it mattered a lot and when you're at the centre of that, all that hate it's a really tough place to be but I tell you what it really did make me respect Corbyn even more because he had he had what six years of that shit and yeah. I, I and, and, and I had about six days and that was enough for me it was horrible absolutely horrible Um. Uh, but at the end, you know, we, we did good with it. I'm, I'm not what they say I am, as everybody who knows me knows. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so. just, it's just an attempt to take down another lefty. Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a good indicator of the, of the bollocks that can come out, and we need to learn that. Eh? Yeah, yeah. As, as, as my mate Joe says, cowards flinch and traitors smear. Yeah, and we'll keep the red flag flying here. <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh, thank i think that's a good way to end on what seemed like a negative but actually is a super positive um yeah. and also thank you again joe for all the support i mean as soon as i saw it i thought we're going to get this guy back on um because you know the stuff you're doing is great we're really hoping you're going to come out to us in may and play some numbers uh in real time we're going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks hopefully we can get you uh Get you a ticket out there Fingers or something. If, uh, if the virus don't do more stuff, you know? yeah, we have a bit That's of those worry, problems. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, we're busy trying to put the festival together here. But thanks for talking about the historical memory stuff, the Lincoln fight against fascism, how your artwork, uh, how you create your artwork, and obviously the day-to-day -day struggles that you're going through, whatever they may be. And look forward to having you back in the near future, Joe. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Solidarity. Okay. Bye now. Solidarity to you. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have something to say to us, then join our Facebook group or contact us at outerspace.com. That's O-U-T-A hyphen space dot com. See you soon. <laughs>